Okay, we might make a, a quick uh, sound check first before we start. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear fine. Okay, thanks, Byron. Um, so, we're week nine's tutorial, so we're going to do some GUI stuff, which is great. And um, so, we're still there in week nine. We've got, next week, we've got characters, strings, and string builder coming up, which is just looking at those classes more deeply characters and strings. And then, we'll look at some optimizations. And string builder and string buffer are two really, really good optimizations you can use to make your strings a lot faster. Week 11 is the input and output for files, and week 12 is all revision. So, one thing we are missing that I would love to cover is exception handling, but that's in the follow on course. Okay, we've currently got four students, four people, that's great. Four here, so it's three and me. Uh, not too many, but anyway, hopefully more will join. I would like to cover exception handling, but uh, we don't officially cover it. So I'll think about that one. I'll see how we go. Okay, now. Pardon me, Mike. Sorry, you um, Before we start, I just wanted to let you know that my Wi Fi has been playing up a lot, so I might drop out completely and I'll be able to rejoin during the lecture. So That's okay, mate. Look, just, just keep me posted. And also, the video yeah. will be on the webpage, on the course webpage, as soon as. Yeah, so like I'm just like it happened during the middle of a thing yesterday, and it really kind of it irritated me. Just wanted to let you know, just in case it happens. Okay, no, no worries, mate. Thanks for letting me know. Uh, good luck. Hope, 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 hope everything's okay. <laughs> okay, so Byron had some questions. Oh, hang on, before we start, Byron had some questions in the lecture class, and he said his markdown supported, and I uh, went off on a tangent there a bit. Um, if you do markdown in, in labels, and these are sorts of the formatting you can do on GitHub. Um, GitHub supports HTML, and you can also uh, use Markdown. And um, so, commands like that for bold and and Reddit, all sorts of things that use this sort of this, this sort of Markdown and strike through and stuff like that. So, um, unfortunately, version eight of Java doesn't support Markdown, um, and Java's not mentioned on the Wikipedia page for Markdown. So, I don't think Java supports it directly. Um, but I don't know about the latest version of Java, like Java 14 is the latest version. Um, so I don't know about that. I don't think it does, otherwise it would be mentioned on the Wikipedia page. Of course, you can always write your own markdown support tool, uh, instead of saying, <laughs> you, know, you, could, you could write your own set text method that took a label. And, uh, set MD to HTML. Now you could write your own method called that, markdown to HTML label text or something like that. <laughs> it went, through, went through and replaced all bolds with whatever and strike throughs with whatever. But uh, yeah, it's probably a, bit, uh, probably a bit advanced for us at this stage. It wouldn't be a particularly little job because Markdown is quite a huge topic. But anyway, I just thought I'd clarify that from week nine's class. Okay, on to the tutorial. And um, I might just start with some little questions just to get us warmed up. So what's a GUI-based application? Give an example. Can anyone give an example of a GUI-based application? Or what is a GUI-based application? And part B is... Um, which, which package or packages contain GUI components in Java? Yep, that's right, Byron. So Byron said um, most, most applications with a user interface um, that, are, that isn't text-based, yeah, yep. So TextPad here is a nice, a nice basic GUI. Uh, Windows Explorer is a, a nice basic GUI. It's got some advanced features like the ribbon bar, which um, some people like, some people don't like. I don't, uh, I've, I've grown to accept it with the ribbon. <laughs> I didn't like it when it first came out. And uh, I mean, even good old programs in Windows 3 are still, his, his file manager from the Windows 3 days, where you could have, um, uh, no, so even that's still 
going strong and it's getting some love on uh, on, on GitHub. People have re re resurrected the code and uh, making it work again. So that's uh, that's terrific to see. So even good old Windows 3 stuff still working great. <laughs> right, so so what's a GUI based application? Anything with a nice with but with buttons and um, WYSIWYG, you know, WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get. Um, you know, nice fonts, labels, and the, the GUI controls we used to sing. Which packages contain GUI components in Java? We talked about a couple of them in the, in the class. What's the main one? Yep, javarex.swing, perfect Wayne. Yep, thank you for that. So, so swing, swing's the main one. And there's also AWT. And there's a third one, JavaFX. The main one, the main one we use is swing. Okay. Um, I'll, throw it, I'll throw it out to the audience. What you want to do next? So we've got this one here. We've got to sketch the GUI from the following code. Um, if you want to have a crack at that, we could do that. If you want to have a crack at creating a GUI from scratch for a little BMI calculator, we can do that. Um, if you want to do some uh, questions in the textbook, we can do those. One, one thing we I would like to do is neaten up the GUI in the lecture example in uh, uh, week nine class. I would like to neaten that up. And that would help you as well. Um, just get a bit, a little bit better at GUI stuff. And also, I'm keeping this in mind as well that I want to slap a GUI on that uh, week, week eight uh, tutorial work that dog dogs and dog tester. So, um, what would you like to do? Would you like to try and sketch the GUI for this? We might as well have a go. Let's have a go. Okay, so. Um, And I want to put the GUI in here as a comment, just so we can have it in amongst our code, keep an eye on things. <laughs> Start off with a blank, blank frame. It's going to be hard for us to do this interactively, though. <laughs> Basically, all you can do is you can see what the super calls. So just check if that's that's called to the super class constructor. We're extending J frame. So we've got a frame. So we've got a frame that looks like this with the, with the three icons in the top corner. Uh, we're calling super to set the details, which should, should set the title, unless something down here overwrites it. There's no other set title. So we've got student details. Okay. So that's our title. And then basically, what you've got to do is just go through and look at the order of the ads. So it's flow layout, everything's flow layout. There's nothing strange getting added here with border layouts and grid layouts. So it's just the order things added. Name, label, name, text field. So name, label is into your name. And name, text field's 30 characters. So that's 30. I'm just guessing, but that's 30. <laughs> and then address label and address text field. I think we can assume for examples like this that it doesn't go up here. Assume they've got the size right for the, for the frame. So, um, and it's 30 characters as well. Um, next one's phone label and phone text field. So just, just proceed like that. That's, that's the way to do it. You have to do one of these. Um, all the way down, and then eventually we come on to radio buttons, where we've added the, the radio buttons to the screen. So TAFE radio button just says TAFE. So I'm skipping ahead a little bit, there's end your phone number. Select your education level. Phone number's 30 characters as well. Select your education level. And these are radio buttons. So 
add, add, add for the radio buttons. The, the um, education level label and then the radio buttons get added to the interface. Also get added to a group so they act like radio buttons. So we've got a TAFE level. Good. That doesn't seem to fit. But of course, we don't know how big our, how wide our screen really is, how, how wide our frame really is. So if you share it on the next line or whatever, that would be fine as well. Postgraduate, otherwise make your window bigger. Okay, so we've added our three radio buttons and then we've got an add, add your details button. So we're gonna assume that just goes underneath here somewhere. Something like that is how it would look. Of course, uh, if you expand, it's, un, it's only using flow layout, so if you expanded the window out, this would all wrap around like crazy. But um, assume it looks something like that. Um, that should be pretty close. So, so check what your fields are, check the sizes, and then just the order they're added in is, the, uh, is what you can do for flow layout. Any, any questions on that one? We could see how close we are. Let's run it. Pretty close, close enough. So we've got no, I've oh, got a set width there, 550, 200. So they did set the width to 550. But uh, of course, we've got, no, we've got no idea if we're doing this on paper, whether they could fit on the one line or not. So uh, that's, 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 that's more than good enough. What we've got there. Any questions on that one? So we've still only got four people. Not many people join us today. We might we might do the BMI calculator, but we might just um, what 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 we need here to really make that work is actually let's have, let's have a go. First thing you do is your imports of a x dot swing dot star. Make sure you remember the Java X and then AWT without the X and the AWT dot event. That's about all, that's about all we need for our for our stuff. Oh, here we go! Wow. Byron's already done it. Well done, Byron. I've done. I've just started it just to save you typing it all out. <laughs> That's awesome. Wow. Okay, so. Oh, yeah, so we just said different case. That's all right. Um, I'll change my file name to match yours. Okay, so we've so we'll just see what's going on there. Oh, okay, just just started. Yeah, no worries. That's good. So we've got um, some components to add. I might copy those over so we can so going to keep going backwards and forwards. So we've got a heading, BMI calculator, load that in. 
So we can do that. Set title, yeah, perfect, that's already done. Enter your name and send them into, into your height. So we need a label, J label, that's height, label. Oh, here we go, here's more. <laughs> Wayne, code from Wayne, beautiful. You just wait a little bit. <laughs> That's perfect. So you can see one thing we didn't do in the lecture is we didn't make, didn't make our GUI components private. And it's fine to do so. Uh, private just means that nothing outside the class can access them directly. Um, so that's, that's probably good practice as well to do that, make, make your GUI components private. That's all good. So I won't, uh, I won't type any more now because people are working on this. So I'll let, I'll let people work on it. And we need to add this, these components to the user interface now. So it's just a bunch of ads, ad statements really. Maybe a set layout, come on. It's good. I'm hesitant to start typing. Here we go. <laughs> that's why I'm hesitant to start typing because I knew more code was coming. Okay, that's looking pretty good. Wayne's code again. That's, that's, that's looking really nice. So, so Wayne and Byron have really uh, done a lot of work here. Can run this now and see what it looks like. Control one, control two. So that's looking fine. For what we're doing so far, that's looking fine. Okay, you can resize things a little bit to make it a bit, a bit neater, but it all depends on your font and your and all sorts of things. So um, if we had a little bit more little bit more time in this course, I'd show you how to get the I'd show you how you can put a button here to click it when you get the size right and it would print it to the screen here and you could just use those those details, but we've got to I suppose we could add it, but I I don't want to show you too much. I don't want to confuse people. Okay, so we've built a user interface. We're going to activate the button. So it's going to be the button dot add action listener. And, uh, I, I didn't actually name what this was that we're using, but it's actually a, a technique called using lambdas. Okay, so. And this is, a, this is called a Lambda operator in Java. And it's just linking the event with a method. That's all it's doing. So when the user clicks a button, the event fires off and it runs this code. Hopefully BMI or whatever you want to call it. Add a private method in, private void, calculate BMI. I might just show you that little trick as well. System dot out dot print line. Get width. It's only a simple trick. I've just put a, I've just put a line of code in my calculate BMI method just for just just for now. Okay. And it's going to get the width of the user interface and put a W there and the height and put a, and put a height, put a H for height and print it to the console screen so that I can see what the, what the setting is that I need to use for my, for these fields here or for the, oh, sorry, these fields here. So you can, you can say so without, without having to guess all the time, you can just 
get Java to tell you what, what, the, what the setting is when you're ready. So let's have a, look, let's have a look at that. Control one, control two. And then I'm gonna resize my window. And that's looking pretty good. Uh, maybe, yeah, a bit more. That's looking pretty perfect. Let's click the button. And you can see that 353 by 169 is the perfect setting. 353, three, six, nine. Close that down, cancel, close the windows. Let's run it again and it should be the right size now. See, so it just saves you guessing what the, <laughs> what, what, what the optimal size is and, and changing these down, you know. I guess taking 100 off, adding 50 on, just saves you doing that, just a little trick. Okay, so let's calculate our BMI. So we can take that out now. That's just for that's just for fun. Okay, so let's have a look at the formula. So BMI is weight in kilograms times height in meters. I think that's squared. So how do we do this calculation? Double my. We might want to do some other things first. Double weight. If anyone can fill in any of those calculations or double, how we can get that data, weight and height, that'd be really good. Perfect, there we go, so Wayne's got the code there. Perfect Wayne, that's exactly what you need. Yep, double dot pass double. So if all the data's coming in as a, as, a, as a string and we need to just convert it to a double, that's perfect. And we'll do the same thing for weight, weight, text, weight field, yep. And we're not doing any validation, we're assuming the user's entering um, something that's reasonable. Then we need to display the results and uh, we'll assume we'll display them to, we'll display them to one decimal place, I suppose, of accuracy. Uh, or should the BMI be a whole number? Hmm. Doesn't say, we'll credit, we'll credit to one decimal place anyway. So we need that label, BMI label. The height needs to be in meters, but they've entered it in centimeters. Oh, have they? Oh, height in centimeters. Okay, cool, cool. Okay, so we need to do a little conversion there. So weight, it's a good idea to put your units on your fields anyway. So we'll go weight in kilograms and height in meters. That doesn't look right to me. So when we get height in meters and centimeters, we're dividing by 100. And that's a magic number. So I put that at the top as a constant. So here is a constant saying, CM meter. Even though it's an obvious number, what, what, what it is, 100. Um, when you've got 100 down in your code here, people might wonder, what does that mean? Is that creating a percentage or what's it, what's it doing? So it just makes it clear. That's what you're doing. Okay, double pass, double. Set text. The body mass index is. We 
got to put a percent sign in there, which means give me the data. Dot one means one decimal place. F means floating point data, like that doubles and floats. And am I close the bracket for the string format, close the bracket for the set text, semicolon, that should be right. Something like that. Control one, control two. So the values in the test screen were 172 and 68, 172, 68. And we've got 23 coming out there. I've got it wrapping on the next line, doesn't really matter. <laughs> so we use that trick again by turning on that line of code to make it even better. Turn on that line of code again if we wanted to, but not going to be that fussy. Okay, so we've got a BMI calculator working. Let's go through and improve things slightly so that we can resize it and not having it wrap all over the place. Okay, so we, we can see if we can make that a little bit better. It's just what we're going to do later on to our other, other code anyway. So let's just see if we can make it a little bit better. So what we want to do is add those two components to the one container. And then we want to add these two components to the one container. And then we want to build our user interface based on those containers so that the label and the text field always stay together, no matter how, make you, how wide you make the user interface. Okay, so here's, here's where we're going to use some containers. And the main container we're going to use is a panel or a J panel. I'll have a height panel. These are just invisible containers where you can add components to them. And it just makes them so they act like a single unit. New J panel. And I'm going to make this a flow panel. So a new flow layout. So we've got a height panel and we've got a weight panel. Instead of adding the height label and the height field to the user interface, I'm going to add them to the panel. So it's going to be height panel dot add. Height panel dot add. Okay. And for the weight for the weight data, weight fields, I'm going to add the weight panel, the weight label to the weight panel, and the weight field to the weight panel. Okay, so instead of adding these to the user interface directly adding them to this panel, which has got a flow layout. And you might be thinking, okay, they've got flow layouts, the user interface has got a flow layout, that's not going to help things, and you're quite right. Okay, so we're going to change our user interface. If you have a look at things as they currently stand, <laughs> as they currently stood, you'll see that it's sort of like one, two, three, four. So it's sort of got four rows of data, or four rows of GUI components we want to keep. Okay, so it's like a it's like a one column four row spreadsheet. Okay, so let's make it let's make it a grid layout. Let's use our good old grid layout. We haven't used this yet. It's a new grid layout, and we want four rows and one column. And one thing I usually do after my grid layouts is I put a R comma C there just to remind me that it's rows and columns. I still do that. <laughs> it's just a habit I've got into, and I've, I've stuck with it. So that's four rows, one column. You can also specify spacing between the rows and the columns if you like by putting extra data. So you could say 10 and five, and that would be a 10 pixel, pixel space between the rows and a five pixel space between the columns if you wanted to. But we've only got one column, so that's not gonna matter at all. Okay, so you can supply these extras if you want for spacing, or, or leave them out, just put four comma one. It'll still look fine with four comma one. So our user interface has now got a grid layout, so that, and it's got four rows, which means we can add four components to our user interface. So the first component we want to add is our height label or height panel. It's going to go in row one. Then we're going to add our weight panel, and then we're going to add our BMI label and our BMI button. Okay, so we're still adding four components to our user interface, but the, this, this, the first one's on a panel. The label and the text field are together on one panel. Okay, so let's run that. Control one, control two. 
and everything's there nice and neat. Let's resize our user interface. Everything's there still nice and neat. The button's huge. We'll come onto that in a second. The button's huge. Okay, everything's still nice and neat. Nothing's wrapping around. Let's shrink it up a bit. Okay. And you can see there is still some problems here with um, the, the text fields wrapping around from the labels, but at least they're staying together. The, the, this enter weight label's not going up there with that text field. Okay, so that's a, that's a huge improvement. Um, we've got this thing here left justified, which we'll fix, and we've got a huge button down the bottom, which might be okay. Okay, if you want a huge button, that's fine. Otherwise, we're gonna make it so we're gonna a regular size button just by adding more panels. So let's do that. Okay, so we're gonna create two more panels. And one's the, the BMI label panel. And one's the button panel. Well, it's, it's called a label panel for now. Label panel and button panel. So two, two more flow layout panels. And we're gonna add the, the BMI label to that one. Okay, for the button panel, we're gonna just add the button. Okay, and instead of adding the label down here, I'm gonna add the label panel. And instead of adding the button down here, I'm gonna add the label, the button panel. Okay, so I've gone from adding the components directly to adding panels, adding, adding our containers. So let's run that and see how that looks. And you see, now we've got a regular size button and our label here always stays centered. So we can expand our user interface and everything still stays the same. It doesn't wrap around all over the place. We can make it really wide. Okay, everything's looking great. Okay, and then we can shrink it back down again. And you'll see that the, you'll see that the label and the text field always stay together. They're wrapped onto other lines, but that's fine. At least you can still see them and use them. It's still pretty clear what you need. Ah, is there a way to scale a font as well? Okay, let me show you one of my... Um, I'll show you one of my little apps that I created. And here I can use the mouse wheel, so I can hold down the control key and use the mouse wheel to resize the, the fonts. Okay, now the mechanism to do that is quite a lot of really nasty complex code. I've got to loop through all the components in the user interface read what the font was, work out what scaling factor to use based on how many mouse wheel rotations we used, and multiply the font scale by a certain factor to scale the font up, and then go through and set all the fonts, every component, to that, to that new font. So this, this could have one font, this could have another font, this could have another font. They could all be different sizes, and it will scale them up proportionally. To do that's quite a lot of code, um, and uh, it took me, it took me uh, you know, quite a few hours to get, the, to get it working for everything because I could get it working for buttons and labels, no worries, but then it wouldn't work for tab layouts. And then, uh, and then it wouldn't work for, um, if I've got little um, panel, panel, panel labels, it, it wouldn't work for those. So I had to go through and <laughs> had all this extra processing on. So yeah, you can do it, uh, Byron, it's a good question, but it's a fair bit of code, way more advanced than we can do in this course. Okay, but... Um, Make sure everything's really, really tiny if you want. So it's, it acts, acts more like a web page. Okay, just by holding the, the, the mouse wheel down and the control key. Um, now, this sort of behavior should be built into Java by default. For some reason, it's not. Okay, which I think is bizarre. Um, because when I started building Java apps, then I went to a 4K screen and Everything was minuscule, even the, even Windows stuff, market stuff that Microsoft released, and uh, applications that I was using from third parties was coming up with the wrong fonts. And I added this into my into my Java tools, and all of a sudden on this 4K screen, the only apps that were usable <laughs> was was my little apps that I'd written. Nothing else was usable. It was all tiny little windows and tiny little. You couldn't even see the button that was so small. I mean the, the button the button label it was so small. So. Um, yeah, so this sort of stuff should be built into applications by default, and it should be built into Java by default. I can't believe it's not. Uh, 
uh, and this is this is one of my Delphi apps that I built back in there. Uh, how long would have been uh, early two thousands? I built this, and even that scales. Oh, and this one doesn't. I've got this one, so it's, it's turned off. But I've got Delphi apps, so you can just resize the window, and it automatically resizes the fonts. And that was the same thing. I had to go through every component, work out how big the new interface was, and scale them up accordingly. <laughs> so, unfortunately. Uh, Java and Delphi don't uh, include that automatically, which is crazy. But good question. So I'll just put that this this question here from Byron. Why not make a child widget and add a scroll listener to each new child widget? That's basically what you do. That's basically what you do, Byron. But then you've got to go through and you've got to read each component's font in the child, scroll through all the components in the child, and uh, and then work out what the current font is, work out what the, the scale has changed by, and then rescale the font accordingly. Yeah, so it's it's it's, it's just a lot of little fiddly, fiddly code. I, I, I can I can I, I can do a video on it if you want, um, but it's not it's not it's not something many Java apps do. Um, Built into Java by default. Mind do even even silly stuff like this emoji emoji tool I've got here. Even that's got it built in. So I can hold it in my swirl and scroll, scroll things around. So even even silly stuff that I write just for fun using the same code. I just go include this library, and uh, and uh, so I could just do. One or two lines of code to include it in my projects now. Um, the old file manager, get rid of that. So we've done we've done the BMI calculator, and I've showed you how to make your code. Okay, it's not uh, it's not perfect. We we could add font scaling in there, of course, and also. Some people might some people might, might not like that the way your text boxes disappear if you make it too small. So maybe it could be better, but that's certainly good enough for what we do in this course. Okay. And the follow-on course. Okay. Any questions for that one? Any anyone want to go through any of the code again? So we've got, we've got our GUI components, thanks to Wayne. We've got our, our, our uh, creating panels and setting the layout. And we add the components to the panels. And we add the panels to the user interface. Okay. And then act activating the button, we're using a Lambda, which is, makes, makes our code so much shorter and so much simpler. And we're linking the button to click events to a method. And we're using a special little lambda to do that, which is makes our code so much shorter, so much simpler. And then we've got some set title, set size, set location, and so on. And uh, some calculations. And that was Wayne. Uh, creating an instance of our app. So one thing we could do down here, just to show you another thing that we could do, we could actually leave all that out. Okay, just say new BMI calculator. Just make our code even shorter if we wanted to. We're not using app anywhere. We're not saying app dot anything. So we could we could actually leave all that out and just say new. Okay, let's run that and make sure the everything's still working fine. Okay, so that's called using an anonymous reference. We're not giving it a name. Here, here, we're, here we're, giving, we're creating an object called app, so we're giving it a name. Here we're using an anonymous reference. We're not giving it a name at all. That's good. 12.40, so we're only 40 minutes in. 
I would love to cover exception handling, but I think, uh, I, I don't think Bruce would like it if I did it. Um, I've got videos on my webpage on exception handling anyway, if you have a look at that. And that means basically you can, the user can type in anything to a text field and you can catch it if it, if it fails in the double pass double or whatever. You can catch it gracefully without your program crashing. Um, because we haven't done exception handling, we can't do this in a neat way. Uh, in, in the proper way, I can just show you a, a bodgy sort of way to do it, not the proper way. Um, what we might do is start with needing up, so we're doing a GUI week, we might need up the code from that lecture example, need up the user interface. See, we are doing GUI, GUI stuff this week. Okay, so let's just remind ourselves what it looked like. And you'll see there if I expand it, it goes all ugly. And uh, if I shrink it, <laughs> shrink it, it's all onto multiple lines, which becomes pretty confusing. We can't make that perfect, but we can fix it, so it's a lot better. Okay, so when I expand it right out, it goes even crazier. And you see everything's up there in the one line. So we can make that so it's a lot better. Just doing that same technique we just done. So let's do that. And you could declare your panels up here with your other GUI components if you like. That would be okay. But you're only really using them inside the constructor. So I'll also keep them inside the constructor. Keep things as local as you can. So let's create some panels. Giant panel. Green panel. UJ panel. Slide layout. Name panel. Each panel. Extras or requirements panel, extras panel. So with leg room and meals. Create a, a payment type. Payment panel. Probably do us for now. So I'll add a heading label to the heading panel. We'll add name label to the name text field to the name panel. We'll add age label and age text field to the age panel. Extras panel, I'll call it extras. We'll add the extras meals and the extras leg room to the extras panel. And we'll add the payments. Payment types to the payments panel, or payment panel. And then we've got a plain type and then we've got a combo box. We'll come on to those, these two later. And uh, so let's just add those to our user interface now. This panel's going to go first. Then name panel. Then age panel. And then extras panel. And then payments panel. Payment panel. So we'll always be grouped together in one area. They're all our inputs, or most of our inputs. We've got plain type as well. Um, So let's see how that looks now. Control one, control two. So it's helped things a little, a little bit. If if one radio button scrolls to the next line, they all move, which is an improvement. And if if one checkbox moves to the next line, they both move. Okay, because they're all in the same panel. So it has improved things. And if the, if, the, if the age label or the age text field move to the next line, 
that they move together as a, as a single unit. You can't move them individually anymore. Okay, so it has improved things, but we can make it we can make it better. So there's not all this wrapping going on all the time. And to do that, we might use a another grid panel, sort of a grid panel with one, two, three, four, five. And we might put that on its own row as well, six. So I have a six row grid panel at the top here. Okay, let's see if we can do that. So I'll create another panel called grid panel. Or top grid, top grid. Because it's going in the top of the user interface. New grid layout. We want six rows and one column. So let's add, add the heading panel to the top grid as the first row, the name panel to the top grid as the second row, the age panel to the top grid as the third row, extras panel to the fourth row, and the payment panel as the fifth row. And we'll also add the plain combo box as the sixth row. Okay, so that there's being added. And let's try and change things slightly here. Let's add the top grid panel. Now we're going to use our border layout features. Let's change our user interface back to border layout. It is by default because it's a JFrame, but let's just make that really clear. Set layout, new layout. It is by default. So if we don't set the layout over user interface, it is border layout by default. So we could leave that leave that code out if you wanted to. But I just like making it really clear that's where it comes from. That's what that's what the setting is. Okay, so border layout. Now we've got the regions. So we've got the north, uh, center, south, east, and west. So we've got those regions. So let's add the top grid panel to the north region. Add the output text area to the center. Okay. And we'll leave this out, leave the buttons out for now. We'll just see how that looks. Okay, control one. Because if we leave those in like that, they'll get added to the center region and override our text area. So that's why I'm leaving them out for now. Control one, control two. And there's our user interface. Okay, so we've got the five, the six rows, a great big checkbox, <laughs> a combo box, sorry, a great big combo box. We'll fix that in a second, don't worry. Okay, but when we resize things, okay, we've still got the name label and the text field wrapping down onto the next line, but that's okay. It's better than, it's better than uh, changing lines uh, and going into other groups. You see, that's a lot better already. Okay, and notice also the text area is expanding to fill the whole region. It's not limited now to that width we gave it. It's actually, it's actually expanding to fill the whole region. Okay. So that's much better. That's much, much better than having stuff wrapping around all over the place. Okay, so just, just uh, adding, a, adding a bunch of panels in, adding the components to panels, and then adding the panels to regions of a grid can make things a lot better. And then using a, a border layout to your advantage. And uh, with those three layout managers, flow, border, and, and grid, you can do just about anything. So let's take care of our buttons now. Actually, we might take care of the, the combo box next. So let's add that to it. To say that being a great big combo box, it fills the, the whole row. Let's make it so it's just a normal size combo box. Okay. So what we want to do is create another panel. Another panel. That's always the answer. Another panel. And it's going to be the, the plain type. Plain type panel.
main type panel. It's got a flow layout. We'll add the plane type combo box to the plane panel, plane type panel, and we'll add the plane type panel to the grid. So the, so the panel will expand to fill the whole region of the grid cell, but the combo box won't, it'll just stay normal sized. Okay, so I've added a combo box to a panel, and then I've added the panel to the grid panel. So the, so the panel will expand, but the grid, the, the combo box won't, it'll stay normal sized. Let's run that. You can see there with a nice size combo box. Okay, so not a huge combo box that filled the whole row anymore. Uh, let's take care of our buttons down the bottom. So we'll create, guess what, we're gonna create another panel. <laughs> panel and flow layout's pretty good that's fine button panel okay so we'll add our buttons to the button panel okay. I'll do that before I finish off the user interface okay I'll add our button panel to the south region of the border so right down the bottom so we're down the bottom of the screen Off. Now our buttons up, up here right down the bottom. Control one, control two. And there's our buttons and we can resize our user interface. And before the buttons were jumping up here and the radio buttons were jumping down the side here, it was horrible and messy, but everything's staying nice and neat now. Of course, if you go too small, we can have that, that thing happening where the label and the, and the text field wrap onto the next line. That's fine for now. We don't, we don't care about that for now. Okay, that's much better. Much, much better. Okay, uh, what else can we do? Hmm. Oh, okay, let's also add some labels in. So here there's a plain type combo box without uh, a label for it. So people don't really know what it is. What's, they might not know what a 747 means. <laughs> so let's make it really clear it's plain type. And we'll add some, we'll add a label for payment type as well. And one for the extras. Just so there's labels before we're all, all the settings. Now we could go up and add labels up here and that would be fine. Or we could create new labels down here and that would be fine. Or we can just create anonymous labels and add them straight to the user interface, which is a little shortcut. It just saves you a little bit of code. Let's use some anonymous labels. Just for fun, just to show you how you can do stuff. Okay, so let's do an extra panel. We'll create a new label, new J label. Are you extras? So we're creating a new label with the value extras but we're not giving it a name. So we're using anonymous labels, just like we did before with anonymous classes. Okay. So like I said, we could have declared a label here or a label up here. That would have been fine. No, that, that would have been fine as well. Just showing you a little shortcut you can use where you don't have to worry about giving the labels a name. Okay. Just saves you a little bit of code. And for, for, um, for the payment types, it's payment type panel, dot add new label, Payment types, payment type, okay. And then for the, for the plain type, it's plain type panel.add, new J label, payment panel.add, new J label, and then extras panel.add, new, new J label for extras. Just a little bit of a shortcut, saves you a tiny bit of code, but <laughs> when you're on a project and you're doing stuff, a little bit of code saving can help. So, control one, control two, and you can see there's our labels coming out. So we've got plain type, payment type, and extras coming out. We've got three extra labels, and we can resize our user interface, and everything stays nice and neat. We can resize it way out there, and everything stays nice and neat. Okay. What else can we do? Do you want to add some icons to buttons? 
<laughs> okay. That as well, if you want, let's add some icons. Um, I'll just grab a couple of icons. I'll grab an ad and a, a reset. So when we declare our buttons now, we'll say, um, if we have a look at the constructor, let's have a look at the constructor for buttons. Uh, J button. See that there's one here. It takes an icon. And there's one here that takes a bit of text and an icon. So we're gonna have just text, just an icon, or text at an icon. I will have the text and the icon just for fun. Okay, so let's have a look at icons, see what icon does. And uh, icons and interface. So not much going on there. Okay, so there's not even a constructor for icon. So what you need to do is have a look at some of the child classes. See also image icon. Video and video from two, oh, there you are. Sorry? Yeah. Sorry, you just froze completely on my screen, so. Okay. Am I okay on other people's Mine screen? Mine also, but yeah, you're good now. Okay, now? Okay. I had a message coming up saying, um, frozen internet or something. Bizarre message. It looks like it's a Zoom message. It's in the same font and colour as Zoom. So sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so there's, no, there's nothing here we can really use in the icon class. We can get icon width and icon height. Paint icon, there's nothing there to actually create an icon. So let's have a look at further. And it says interface as well, it's an interface class. We can't talk about those till a follow on course. <laughs> there's a whole lot of stuff we can't talk about. So this, the only place we can really look, on, look at further is this, see also this, so let's have a look, see what's there. Image icon, it's a swing class, so swing at javarex.swing.image icon. So that's included by default with our import, javarex.swing.star, it's already included. Let's see if we can load a file here. Constructors. Uh, so we've got an image icon constructor that takes an image and also an image icon constructor that takes a file name. Ah, so we're looking pretty good there. Image icon. Okay, so looks like that's what we can use to create our image, new image icon file names. There's an example, new image icon. And it's got an images folder and new, my image dot gif. It's a very small font, I can barely read it. So let's see if we can use that. So go to our buttons, which are here. Press it in there. We're not using images in the subfolder. That would be a that'd be a better thing to do, but I'll just leave mine in the same folder for now. And it was called add.gif. And I'll add another one for the clear, which was reset. Okay, so I've now got a button that should have a, a, a bit of text and an image. A bit of text and an image. Let's see if that works. You can see they have got images on their buttons, which just makes things a little bit nicer. Okay. At one o'clock, we've got five people and we're still at one o'clock, so we've got an hour left. What I might do some, now is do some validation. So we're up to version three of our class now, not version one. Uh, we might add some validation in here just so I can show you how validation might work. Again, we haven't done exception handling, so I can't show you the really good way, the, the clean way. The clean way is that the um, our, our, our data class, we should have a data class for 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 flight details or for, for bookings details. We should have a booking class and that should have methods to check whether a booking is valid and that should throw exceptions if there's any exceptions in the data or the data's invalid. We don't have any of that set up at the moment. We, don't, we haven't done enough, uh, we haven't done exception handling yet.
So all we can really do now for now is just to do it in the add method, which isn't the proper way, but that's all we can do for now. Let's make a little note here, just so pe people realize that what I'm showing you isn't, isn't the perfect way, but it's all we can do for this course. So proper way is to use a booking class Okay, so our, our booking data class should handle the, the validation. And if there's an issue with the data, throw an exception. And our GUI should watch for exceptions and handle them and display swing error dialogues. Okay, that's the proper way. <laughs> we haven't done. Internet connection's unstable, again. Okay, did, did things freeze there again? Internet connection was unstable, I got that message again. It's definitely a Zoom message. So it's definitely a problem with Zoom, not my internet. Yeah, it did, um, it freeze. did freeze up a bit again. Okay. Um, so, so I'll show you the next, the next, Just, just keep that in mind. I'm, I'm not showing you the right way. Uh, I'm, I'm showing you the only way we can do it with what we've done so far. Okay, so let's do that. And you remember the the uh, the, the, the validation we way I showed you for, for batch programs? We'll do something fairly similar, but we're not going to loop and keep asking the user over and over again. So let's just create a, a, a Boolean field. Input's valid. Equals true assume everything's assume everything's good and we'll try and prove it false we can assume everything's false and try and prove it true whatever or whatever way you want to do it all, all roads lead to rome okay let's check the let's check the name field string name string is equal to name text field dot trim so we're going to remove the leading spaces from our name field Okay, if name string dot length, so if the length of what they entered after we've removed leading and trailing spaces and tabs, if that's less than three, then we're going to display an error. Like that name must be at least three chars long. Again, we've got magic numbers here, three and three, so they should be constants. <laughs> okay, so we do here make the three a constant. Okay, so you've got um, so we've, we're going to display an error to the user. We also want to make it really clear to the user which field has got the which of the input fields has got the error so we're going to put the cursor in there for them so they can automatically start typing straight away so we want to do that before we display the error so request focus so we're putting the cursor inside that inside that text field so they can just start typing when the dialogue disappears and we also want to say that invalid inputs is is false Okay. 
So we've done our first bit of checking. Let's go down further. If invalid inputs is still true, we're going to do the next bit of checking. Okay, let's check the age. String, or let's get let's get the age directly. Int age is equal to. And we're going to trim that to get rid of the leading leading and trailing spaces. And we're going to do an integer dot pass int on it. Everything comes in as a string, so let's convert it to an integer. Okay. If age is less than eighteen or whatever you want to put. I'm just putting that for an example. If we've got an age less than 18, we've got an error. So we're gonna put the we're gonna put the cursor into the age field. We're gonna say that age you must be 18 or over. Hit fly. EQ Uni Airlines, whatever. Okay, uh, we've got the age text field getting the focus. We've got a, an error, and again, we've got magic numbers. They're using the constant there and the constant there. This is coding it like this with the, with that value repeaters like fingernails on a chalkboard for me. It's making my my fingers twinge. <laughs> I've, got to look, I've got to look away. <laughs> okay, again we set inputs to false. And if we had if we had more inputs, we just do the same thing. If inputs is valid still, check the next input. If inputs is valid still, check the next input. Okay, and eventually we come down here. And everything's valid. Okay. And then we do our processing. So what we probably want to do, because we want to, because we want, don't want to get this data twice. We've got the age here. We don't want to get it again down here. So maybe what we'll do is we'll make these fields. Up there and just use them down here. Okay, int age is equal to zero, and just just use age down here. Don't declare it again. Okay, so declare all your fields up here at the top, so they're available for all of the all of the class, all of the method. Uh, they're not going out of scope when you get to this curly bracket. And then down here, you could just use name string and age. And so on. All the inputs are invalid, so we want to input in, indent all that. And we want to indent all that. Okay. So you don't want to clear, you don't want to clear the inputs if there's an error. That'll drive the user crazy. <laughs> so make sure that code doesn't run if there's an error. Make sure it's in that if, if everything's valid sort of branch of the if statement. Okay, so it's similar sort of validation to what we're doing with the batch processing with the console apps, but there's no loops. There's no looping until the input's valid. No looping, you just display an error and stop. Okay, and we're using the inputs valid flag to control everything. If inputs are still valid, check the next bit of input. If inputs are valid, check the next bit of input. If inputs are valid and you've checked all the inputs, then you can go ahead and process things. You assume everything's valid. Okay. So, any any questions on that? Any questions? So, no loops. Definitely no loops. It drives the user crazy. If you're popping up popping up dialogue saying error, 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 the user will scream. <laughs> And, uh, and they won't want to use your software anymore. Okay, 
so let's run that. I'm going to click add and the name's not valid. Must be three characters long. Okay. Stop. No more errors. You don't display and the age is wrong and this is wrong and that's wrong. One error and stop. And you'll see the, the cursor's flashing inside the name field. I want to put the cursor inside here in the age field. I'll click enter, add again. Name must be three characters long and you'll see the cursor's flashing up there in the, in the name field. Ready to type. Click add again. Oh, we'll do it with just two characters. Add, name must be three characters long, at least. Okay, so it's four characters long now. Oops, and we've got this, our program's crashing. Number format exception, input string blank. Number format exception on line 65. Okay. That's in the, that's in the, that's in our, that's in number format exception.java, that's not our code. Integer.parsing, line five, six, 592, that's not our code. Lecture GUI example, haha, -ha, that's our code there. So add details, lecture GUI example, Java 181. So it's on line 181 where the error happened in our code. Don't look through the Java, don't try and find a Java code, you'll get lost. Just go to the first bit of code you recognize, which is the Java GUI example, add details method, line 181. Okay, and of course that's where the that's what we're doing the pass int. So we're trying to pass in a blank string. Okay, so what we could also do if you want is also check if if the age text field if that if that's greater than zero. Okay, but uh, we're getting into exception handling territory here. So maybe what we could do just to start with is just make it so that we we we'll, we'll just assume the users type something that's valid for now rather than getting into really complex stuff. Because really we don't, we're gonna simplify, when we do exception handling in a follow on course, we'll be simplifying all of this code. It becomes much, much simpler. Okay, so Mike, an assumed have entered something that's a reasonable integer and I'm 16 years old and I'm gonna click add and you must be 18 or over to fly with. Okay, 18, click add and everything was added fine. Okay, so if there's any errors, try and help the user out by putting the cursor in the text box and, uh, or, or whatever, selecting, selecting whatever's wrong and display a meaningful error. Now, one thing you might notice here, I'll, I'll move the application over here and click add. The, the dialogue's appearing here. If I move it over here and click add, the dialogue's appearing here. So the dialogue's appearing in the center of the screen. Okay. Imagine we're using a, a three or four screen system and this app was running over on our screen right over here somewhere. And, uh, and all of a sudden the, the application is not working. It's because a dialogue's appeared on the middle of our main monitor somewhere and the user hasn't realized. Okay, so a really good thing to do is to make it so your dialogues appear centered in the application. Okay, sounds complex, doesn't it? It's really quite easy. So instead of the null, we want to make that something else. So instead of saying show message dialog to null, we want to just change that one parameter. Okay, let's do that. And we get our class name that's extending the frame. So we get that chap there. And instead of null for our error messages, we're going to put class name dot this. Okay. So whatever your, whatever your GUI class is, dot this instead of null. Same here. So do it for all your dialogues, all your errors, all your input dialogues, any other dialogues you got. Okay, so whatever the GUI class is, dot this. Just making that one little change means that our dialogues now appear centered in our application. So if our application is running three screens that way, they'll still appear centered in the application, not in the middle of your primary monitor. Okay, and everyone's running multiple monitors these days. I'm, I'm running three at home, so. Uh, okay, so our application's here. We'll click add, and look at the dialog appearing right there. Let's move it down the bottom, click add, and there it is running right there. 
over here, click add. And I think that the dialogue's always appearing right in the middle of the application. Okay, so just a little trick. Instead of using null for your dialogues, you, you now know what you can type there to make something a lot better. Okay, Wayne's made a comment here. You could also have made a display error method. Yep, we could do that. Let's do that. I like that idea, display error. Um, this is Wayne's, uh, Wayne's idea. Public or private, private void display error. Taking a string, which is the error message. String. It's basically just that code that we just looked at. Instead of the hard coded message, it's going to be that error message. String. Put one, one, one line, save a bit of space. And then we just go display error if we wanted to. Display error. Yep. I like that idea. Means you, can, means you can simplify and shorten a lot of stuff. Okay. Um, 117, so we've still got a fair bit of time. Let's look at some other improvements we can make. So show message dialog. Let's have a look at J option pane in the, in the Java help. J option pane. J option pane. Let's have a look at some constructors. And you'll see there's different error message types. And this affects the icon that appears. So you've got error message, information message, warning, question, plain message. And you've got different options you can have as well. So you can have OK, cancel, yes, no, all that sort of stuff as well. But we want to have an error message. So let's see, if we, let's see where we can find out and how, how, how we can use the message type. Message type. So you've got the frame, which is our um, lecture GUI example dot this. That's the frame. The, the error message, message that appears in the title bar, the options you want, and the type of dot, the type of icon that appears. So let's grab that. The error message, it's our error message. That's our frame. It's like your dialogue example like this. That's that one. This is the, the title message that appears in the title of the frame. So we'll just make that error. We want the yes, no, or okay, cancel. I quite like the okay, cancel. Because we're displaying a dialogue that's really okay or cancel. Uh, let's do that. Uh, we might have actually used this one. It's a little bit shorter. There's no, no option there to use the OK cancel. We'll just have an error message. Okay, so now we should have a title that says error, and we should have a little icon that indicates it's an error message icon, uh, error message dialog. OK, control one. Mm. You option? missed the E. <laughs> missed the E. <laughs> okay. Hit the add button, and you see we've got the error icon appearing, and also the title's got error in it as well. Little, little improvements. All these sort of things can help your application just be that little, little bit nicer, a little bit better. Um, another thing you can do if you're really keen, if you're, if you're really, really keen, you can say name text field dot set background. Background. I think it's up at G. All right, background. Color dot red. Here we want to set it to the normal color, which is white, the white background. And here we're setting the color if there's an error. So we'll put the we'll put the cursor in there and also make it red. <laughs> if you want to do that, you can do that. So when you click the add button. So the user can really see where the error is. It just makes it really, really clear. Just little, little tiny one line changes can make your program so much more usable. Okay, we can do the same thing for age. Age text field. 
Got set back around the color red. If there's an error up here, make sure you set it to white, otherwise it'll stay red if you set it red once. Okay, so set them all to white at the start and then set them to red if there's an error. Okay, so I've got uh, an error with name. The cursor's there, I can just start typing. Click out again. Oh, we've got the error with, uh, with the empty string. Sorry. Three there is the age, click add, and you can see the, the, the combo box has gone, or the data entry box has gone red. So we just type 33, click add, and everything's fine. We can stop it so if you if the user clicks add, we can make it so the, the, the data entry box for age has got a value of zero. Just stops that error from happening quite as badly. Age text field. Just anywhere in your construct is fine. Age text field dot set text zero. And also when we do the reset defaults down here after the add successful, we want to make sure that's a zero. Make it so that program won't crash anymore if we click add without adding anything for age. It won't crash, it'll still display an error. See, it's got the zero there. Add. It's got to be greater than 18, so at least that program's not crashing now. You really want to do this code here. I still last us so long with that being un unneat and that. <clears throat> but you really want to do this at the start as well. So when the application first runs, you want to do this code here. And also every time the add is successful. So let's make it its own method. Private read set default values. Default values. So you want to call that in your constructor. So you want to do it instead of doing that, you just want to call a set default value somewhere in your constructor. It doesn't really matter where. Um, you can even do it after that if you want. It doesn't matter where. Okay. You can do it before that, you can do it anywhere, anywhere in your constructor. Uh, as long as the components exist. And, um, and also we want to do it after the ad's successful. Set default values. I think we've got clear button being set to disabled up here as well. Clear button. Yep, so it's set enabled to false. We can also do that and set default values if you like. So we'll take it out of there. Because by default it should be should be false. Um, maybe not. I'll leave that one there. Control one, control two. And there's our defaults all set. One click clear, everything's gone. So we've done pretty well all we need to do for GUIs. Um, what about if you wanted to pop up a conf confirmation dialog if the user clicks the cancel button? Are you sure you want to clear everything? Let's do that. So we've done confirms, confirm dialogs in the past, and um, they return an integer. So int result is equal to j option pane dot show confirmation dialog. Just check the help on a confirmation dialog. Show confirm dialog. Show confirm dialog. So we've got a whole bunch of constructors there. Um, So parent component, again, that's our, our GUI class dot this 
uh, objects and message string title, the option type. That looks pretty good. Whole bunch here we can choose from. I think I'm happy with that one. So show confirm dialogue. We want our class name dot this, so it's in the center of the center of the the frame. If you want to appear is clear everything. Are you mad? Confirm clear. That's the title in the little top of the dialog, and the option type. Is let's have a good option type. So that's again, it's your buttons. Um, okay, cancel, yes, no. Let's do a yes, no. Let's do a yes, no option. And it's J option pane dot yes, no option. So that's going to display our dialogue. And that if, if that returns, if equals that returns an integer. We're going to check for yes option. So if the result is equal to yes option, which is an integer value, it's got a value of one, I think. You can display it to the screen if you want to. But, um, but it's just best to use the constants that are built into the class. So just constants built into the J option pane class. Control one, control two, three, add, click the clear button. Are you mad? No, I don't want to clear it. Nothing cleared, clear again. Are you mad? Yes, I am mad. Everything's gone. Okay, so now we've got a confirmation dialogue on our clear. We've got some basic validation in place. Again, it's not the right way to do it, but it's all we can do for this course. The better, the better ways to do exception handling with the errors being thrown from your bookings class, if there's an error, because the bookings class should be doing all the validation. Okay, but we're, we're not there yet. Okay, cool, cool. So Wayne's just asked me a question there. Can you go back to where the, the panels were added to the, to, the, uh, to the border layout? Yep, sure. So we've got the, th the three regions of our screen. And so top grid's gonna go in the north region and top grid contains the heading line, which is in the heading panel, the name panel, which has got the, the name label in the name text field, the age panel, which has got the age label in the age text field, the extras panel, which has got, it's got an, a label and uh, meals and uh, extra leg room. We've got the payment panel, which has got the payment type and the checkboxes for the different payment types. And then we've got the plain type, which has got the plain type label and the plain type combo box. So we're building all those items up into the top grid panel, which has got a, a layout of six rows and one column. Okay. So adding all those items into the top grid panel. And we're adding all panels in because by default, the panel will expand to fill the grid cell, but the components inside the panel won't expand to fill it. So we won't have those ugly big buttons and ugly big uh, combo boxes and things like that. Okay, so that's building up the top grid panel. We're adding that to the north region of the user interface. Then with the output text area, that's being added to the, to the center region. And the button panel's being added to the south. And the button panel contains just two, two buttons, the add and the clear. And um, pretty well all our panels are flow layout, apart from the top grid panel and our user interface, which has got a border layout. Okay, so when I say panel.add, I'm adding components to the panel. Uh, when I say, um, so it's adding, it's adding components to the panel, components to the panel. And when down here, when I say add without anything in front of it, that means to the current user interface. Okay, so this is, this is actually where things appear on screen. Let's 
or adding items to the JFrame. If we, if we took those lines out there, nothing would appear. They're being added to panels, but the panels aren't being added to the user interface. So this is the key bit. This is where everything suddenly appears on screen. Yeah, I was still sort of partway through putting all the elements into the panels when you Sorry, did that. Sorry, yeah, I, 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 did, I did skip around. Sorry, Wayne. Yeah, um, but it's all like it's all like putting a jigsaw together. Don't try and get your whole user interface perfect. Just play with a bit of it. Get the top part working, or the or the you know one of the regions working, and just slowly, slowly build it up. It's like a, it's like doing a jigsaw. It feels like doing a jigsaw to me, or or playing Tetris. You're getting all the bits to fit together. Oh, here's some more, there's some more uh, defaults there that we don't need to set up here anymore. We're setting those down in our set default values method. So I can take that out, chop. So editable to false the text area. That's, that's only set once anyway. We don't need to set that again, so that's fine there. Some tool tips. One thing we could add really easily as well is the scroll bars for our text area. Let's just add some scroll bars. If I make it scroll like this, see no scroll bars appear automatically? Okay, and also if our data was really wide. Here it's not, here there's no horizontal scroll bar appearing. Okay, we can add scroll bars to a text area really easily. What you need is a scroll pane panel. Okay, so up here for our output text area. We can, we can also leave the size out now. The size doesn't matter. because It's being added to the center region. It expands to fill. So we don't need to worry about setting a size. We did have 2050 there before. We don't need to do that anymore. It's being added to the center region. You can leave that out. But all, let's also add a scroll pane. J scroll pane. Let's have a look at the help for scroll panes. J scroll pane. Okay, so you've got... Um, Fields, constructors, one of the constructors part. And you want a component that you're adding, we're adding a component. If we just add a component on its own, you get the default scroll bar behavior, which might be okay. And that creates a scroll pane that displays the contents of the specified component, where both horizontal and vertical scroll bars appear whenever the component contents are larger than the view. So the scroll bars only appear when they're needed. Okay. You can also make it so they appear all the time. And there's a policy here for for horizontal and vertical scroll bar policy, VSB policy, HSB policy, just two, two integers. Okay, let's have a look at VSB policy. I think it's up the top here. Um, just gonna find where it is. Sorry for all the scrolling. Horizontal scroll bar policy and vertical scroll bar policy. So that's it there. And you can say set horizontal scroll bar policy. And there it is there, that's what I wanted. Visible always. Okay. So, so if you want your scroll bar so they don't, don't just suddenly appear, which I find a bit disconcerting. I like them always present, but disabled when they're not needed. That's why I like mine, but you might like yours different. You know, you can have them as needed or never or always. They're the three options for each horizontal and vertical. So I want to add mine so they're always there and they're not, they're just not enabled until you actually need them. So J scroll pane output scroll pane equals new output scroll pane. What do, what do I want to scroll? It's the text area. Want the always and in which order do they, do they go? Vertical scroll bars. Let's just have a look at our constructor again. Sorry for all the scrolling. There's quite a bit of scrolling here. So it's a vertical scroll bar policy first, then the horizontal. So I've got the horizontal scroll bar policy there that I want to implement. Let's add the vertical one in. So 
the vertical scroll bar always and horizontal scroll bar always and a round bracket and a semicolon and that finishes that line of code it's quite long i'll put it onto the next line okay, so basically what we're saying is we're putting the output text area into the scroll bar in, into the scroll pane and we want the vertical scroll bars always on and the horizontal scroll bars always on but they won't be enabled and active until they're actually needed and java takes care of that automatically for you so now instead of adding the text area to the user interface we want to add the scroll pane okay so let's do that so no size for the text area we don't have to worry about that anymore it's ignored once you add the text area to a border region the, the size that you specify is ignored so you must just have that and we want to add the scroll pane instead of the text area so let's do that so down here we're going to go add the output scroll pane We used to add the text area, now we're adding the scroll pane that the text, the, the, the text area is included in. Control one, control two, and you see they've got the scroll bars. Look, woohoo! But they're, disact, they're, they're inactive, you can't actually use them to scroll yet. They're, they're uh, completely inactive. Let's add some data. and I'm click add and you'll see this horizontal scroll bar suddenly turn on and there it is you can scroll across and if we add heap, heap more data and we make the window really small you'll see the vertical scroll bar suddenly turns on so it's turned on When we move it down so it doesn't need, it's not needed anymore, it turns off, it's disabled. When we scroll up, it's on again. Okay, horizontal scroll bar is on because we need to scroll across. If we make the window really wide, it turns off again. Okay, so that's pretty cool, isn't it? So just a little bit of code and you can just make your, your application that much more usable. So one thing we could do here is to format our data. And then I'll put that in a to-do for you guys to do. So format your data. Use string.format. You get nice columns and everything for your data in two decimal places and whatever, whatever else. So that's still to do. We've needed up the GUI, so done. We've added, we've added basic validation of inputs. We've set the default values to the same own method. We've added scroll bars. We've added a confirmation dialog here. And, uh, added icons to buttons. Layer. That was Wayne's, Wayne's idea. Yep, that's Wayne's idea. Good idea, that one. I like that idea. Um, anything else you want to have a play around with? What we could do really quickly, if you like, is go through the assignment to code that you're actually given. Let me just see if there's any questions there. But anything else? Any questions on this code before I move on? It'll be up on the web page as soon as class finishes. I'll, I'll add it up there. So just, if you want to do a bit of formatting, string format, get your data into nice, neat columns, two decimal places where it's needed or whatever. And uh, nice row of headings. <laughs> um, let's have a quick look at the assignment two code. Let's see if there's any questions in here. So this this is actually the way I like doing my imports. I like I like naming what I use. This is this is good this is good practice. But if you want to if you're in a hurry and you just want to use asterisks, that's fine as well. So you'll find for nearly all the two questions I use asterisk. But for if I'm doing a project seriously for a client, I name all the inputs so that uh, it's clear what I'm using. So here we've got extends JFrame. 
and uh, it's done the old way here using the, the pre-Java 7 code, implement action listener, and then you would have an action listener class down here. Or action perform method. So the action perform method, and it handles all the button clicks. So if it's at the end of button, run enter, if it's display all, run display all, search, run search, exit, do exit. Um, and that's done up here with the add action listener this. So this is adding a communal action listener to all the buttons, one listener for all the buttons. And they all come down here and run this code if they're clicked. So not, not too far away from what we're doing, but we the, the simpler way would have been to do this. And you could have got rid of all that, just, just delete all that. Just do that for each button. Okay. But, uh, also for writing the window closing event, we've done that before. Uh, oh, actually, okay. So we haven't done this yet. Let's, let's do this. So if you want code to run when you click the exit, exit, uh, um, icon in the top right-hand corner, or if you've got an exit button, you want to do this sort of code. Okay. And then, so when, when you use a choice to exit your application, no matter how they do it, this exit method will run and you can pop up a dialog saying, are you sure you want to exit? So let's do that. We'll add that into our class as well. Let's just check how things work now. Control one, control two. If we close, no dialog. Okay. No warning. Do you want to save your data? Are you sure? Do you, do you want to leave that booking half? Half done, are you sure? Nothing like that. So let's add some code in here to do that. Let's just add code there, basically. Let it into our constructor. It's really, really sort of code you just copy and paste. Let it in here. Okay. And we'll add our own exit method. And I'm doing it down here with the clear with the clear button is because I'm going to grab this code. <laughs> Private void exit. Grab that code there just as is. Exit application. Are you mad? Yes. Confirm exit. If they, if they say yes, then we're going to go System, exit, round bracket zero. And we're returning an error code. So there's something called our application. It could check the error code. And the error code would be zero. And zero indica indicates everything's all okay. Normally a negative error code indicates a problem. And a positive or zero error code indicates everything's okay. I'm just going to return zero. And everything's fine. So now we've got an exit, exit method that will run no matter how the user wants to close the application. If I click the little X icon, this dialog will appear now. Okay, let's do that. Control one, control two. Close. Are you sure you want to exit? Are you mad? No, I don't want to exit. Ooh. Okay, so got something to do with the uh, overriding. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So uh, up here, we still had exit on close. We had clicked the close icon. Java had displayed, done what we'd asked, and displayed the exit method. And the exit method said, "Don't clear," because we clicked the yes button. So this code didn't run. But but we didn't tell Java not to exit. Still, okay. So let's have a look at that. So set default close operation. Let's have a look in the help on that. And you'll see there's a do nothing. J frame, set default close operation here. We want the one for a frame. And you'll see there's do nothing on close. So there's hide on close, which is the default. Oh, sorry. There's yeah, the hide on close, which is the default if you don't set anything. 
there's dispose on close, there's exit on close, and there's do nothing on close. Let's do the do nothing on close. So now the program won't close unless our system.exit command runs. Okay, so Java won't exit automatically if you click the X icon. Okay, so the user click no now and it won't exit. Control one, control two. Click that. Are you sure you want to exit? No. And then we didn't exit. Okay, because we've got the do nothing on close now. Let's click close and click yes. And we're gone. Okay, so. Let's also add an exit button. Just for a bit of fun, we'll add an exit button. So we've got an exit in the top right as well as an exit button, just for a bit of fun. I don't have an icon for that one. I won't, I won't bother by looking for one at this stage. It's, you can add that in if you want to. So we've got an exit button. We've got a, we're going to add it to the button panel, which is down here in this button panel. The button panel. And we want to activate the button, so it calls the exit method. It's where activations dot. And we've also already got a method it can call, and it's that method there. It's our exit method that we've already done. So if they click the X icon, our exit method will run. If they click the exit button, our exit method will run. And whether or not it exits depends on whether they click the yes or the no. Control one, control two. Click the exit, no. Click the exit, okay. Everything's gone. Let's have a look through, through the assignment. So that's the, the window closing. We've got the communal action performed there, which is the old way to do things. I've showed you the new way, which is much better. But Bruce, Bruce, Bruce has provided this code for you, so you might as well stick with it. You might as well stick with that code. It's, it works fine. All you need to do is fill in the details of these methods. Okay. The end of method. So these comments might not be the right order. You've got to work out what the right order is and move things around. And um, you've got a display heading method there, which is putting the headings in your text area. And um, so you want to do your validation. If everything's okay, then you want to create a pizza object and, and uh, add it into your array. Okay, so we've done all that with the dogs class. We did, we did it in a console app. Um, so if we had a bookings class here, So if all inputs are valid and we had a bookings class set up, here's where you'd want to create a new booking. Booking. Yeah. Then you want to pass through the details, name, age, whatever, to your booking. And then if you had a booking array, you'd want to go, and that's an array list. You want to add it into the Add that new booking into your array list. If we had the headings method, then you want to display headings. You want to display booking. The one that was just added. So you have a display booking method that would display one of the bookings in your array list, or maybe all the bookings in your array list. Display booking. Uh, bookings array list dot size. This one, okay, so we're displaying the, the last one in the array, which is at the size minus one. You probably want to do that after you've done these other inputs down here. So you wouldn't want to build up out string here. You'd want to do that in your display booking method. Okay, but basically you want to create a new booking, add it to your array list. I wish we'd done this in the shoot now. Um, week nine, week 10, doing it next week's a bit too late. Um, uh, I might do another video after class and I might do another video this afternoon. So keep an eye on my, 
YouTube there for another video and I'll, um, I'll do another one where we actually do the booking, create a booking and add it to the array list and display heading from display bookings and do a search maybe. And um, multiple we, we, don't, don't, don't bother getting AVG, it, it's, it's just nagware. <laughs> So that's the code you need to write in here. I'll, I'll probably fill in a bit of that detail there after class, if you like. Clear fields, we've done, set the defaults. Uh, error messages, we've done that as well. So we've done a lot of that. We just haven't done a part where we um, create the booking and add it into the array list. Oh, you're not allowed to use an array list? Is it just, that's just an array, isn't it? Yeah, so you gotta, yeah, so similar sort of thing, but it's an array. So you might have a place for 10 pizzas and each time you're adding a pizza in, you're taking, taking one off the number of available spaces. Yeah. So the enter method display headings, the append line, the display all. So here displaying all the pizzas that are in the array. Okay. Search method. To search for all pizzas or use, use the name field and search for any pizzas for that name. If, if that name's ordered multiple pizzas, do you, do you want to display all or just the first one? That's something you've got to work out whether which, what you want to do. The exit method. I suggest you probably want to pop up a dialogue here and say, do you want to exit? And some pretty standard stuff there. We've seen all that code before. So he's basically got to fill in the gaps. So search and display all. And I'm pretty sure we had all that, a lot of that code already for our dogs class, dog tester. Yeah, so we're creating it. We're creating our dogs here. These will be from the user inputs. Okay. Um, here it's doing it for an array list, but it's similar sort of code for your array. It's just you've got to keep track of uh, current index, set it to zero. <laughs> and every time we add an item to it, you're adding one to current index. Okay, or, or added, whatever you want to call it. Here we're doing a search for Frankie, searching for Frankie, dogs.get. So I've already written that code there, dogs.get. And um, yeah, we're searching for one in there. If you want to search for all, um, you might want to change this so it's returning multiple. Okay. Now in, in the assignment as well, you don't have a separate array class. Say so your array and the GUI are all in one class. Uh, normally you split things out. So you've got the, the data class, the array class, the GUI class are all separate. But in the assignment, the array class and the GUI class are together. So um, so here the, here the dog was doing the searching through the array, which only it, it, access, it had access to. In here, your array's inside here, so we can just search for it directly. So it's a little bit, little bit simpler code because it's all in a one class. Okay. So here, here you've got two classes. You've got your pizza class and your GUI and array class together. So in the tutorial last week that I didn't go to, yep. um, at one part you said, um, like after you'd done your own search and sort methods, you said something about investigate how this could be done easier. Uh, oh, okay, yes. Because there are methods built into, because we're using it. This is not really for assignment because it's to do with array lists. But in array list, if I look at the array list class, you'll see there's some methods in here to help us. And there's a, a contains method. Okay, and that returns true or false, depending on whether, if you've got an array list of strings, you could say, uh, if array list, if my array list dot contains the name Mike, if that returns true, then it's there. So I can just say if you're doing the looping, it's, it's got some methods that are built in that will help you. There's a contains method. 
um, change is the main one. With array lists as well, you can do sorting really quite easy with array lists. There's my sort method. So if you want to sort an array list, you can use a bit of a shortcut. Um, although it's using code we haven't done yet. Uh, yeah, maybe stick with this way of sorting for now. I don't think you need to sort for the assignment anyway, but um, yeah, there's no, no, no sorting in the assignment. But, uh, but if, if, if you want to sort an array list, there is a shortcut to use to using that, but it needs, some, needs a little bit more Java than we've done. You need to use iterators. It's only one line of code, but it's code that we haven't done yet. So I don't really want to show you at this stage. So um, yeah, you can shrink all that down to one line of code if you, if you use an iterator. But, um, in fact, there is a sort there. Let's do it. Asking here for a comparator, and this is an area we haven't got into yet. So you've got to write some code in here that we haven't done. So I don't really want to throw a whole lot of new stuff at you when the assignment's due, <laughs> but um, but you can you can do it with one lines of code, just just like that by just typing something in here. Um, and it's to do with, if you want to compare dog names, it's, it's got that included in there, but there's a little bit of code in here you have to type, which I don't want to, I don't want to really go into at this stage. But you can shrink that code down to use the built-in sort. Um, you can use a built-in search. There's a built-in search inside here as well that, that contains. So you can see if an array list contains a certain uh, string or whatever. Um, but again, it's not going to help you for a summit because this is a sort of array list. The summit's all on arrays. So, since you asked about it in the tutorial, I went looking and figured out how to do it. A few different cool. ways to do it. Cool, cool. Awesome. It's not it's not complex code, is it? It's just it's just using something we haven't quite done yet. I didn't want to. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, any other questions before we head off? Okay. So we've done we've done pretty well all of this, but we did it with an, an array list. So you just need to adapt it to do use an array notation. So you need to keep track of how many items. Or what index? What the current index is? You say, in other words, how many items have you used so far in the array? How many storage locations? You want to check the max. Okay, before before you add an item into the array, you want to check um, have I got room in the array? Okay, so you got a, you got a max size there or whatever, and um, so you want to make sure that this current index is less than max size or maybe less than max size plus one, depending on or minus one, depending on how you're counting max, depending on how you're counting current index. And every time you add an item into the array, you want to add one to this current index or current size or whatever, whatever you, whatever you call it. Okay, so we've done it for array lists. All you need to do is adapt that code for arrays. Um, are you going to loop through all items in the array that have been used so, so far? So you might have 10 locations in the array, but you might have only added three pizzas. So you want to loop through whatever that field is, you're keeping track of how many you've added. You want to look through that many pizzas and just display that many. Okay. Um, I recommend you add a display, add an extra method in, display pizza or display order, whatever, and pass through an integer. I recommend you add this method as well. And you'll just be checking if, if the index is less than zero 
or it's greater than the current index. In other words, how many pizzas you've added. Um, error, else display the pizza. That's pseudo code, of course. <laughs> Uh, and then you can call that down here in your display all in the, inside the loop. And you can also call it up here when you've added a pizza to the, to the array. Okay, so just so you're duplicating that same code twice. Um, and it's probably a good idea in your, in your pizza class, to your pizza class, the two string method gives you a string representation of your, of your pizza order and have it so it's all lined up with the with these columns. So, so use, it, use, a, use that formatting flag there as a starting point and get all your data lining up nicely in columns using that format. Wanted to change things slightly because you've got a size here might be an integer. So it might, be, might not be 7s, it might be maybe 7d or something. And it might, might not be minus, it might be positive 7d. So you might need to play with things slightly, but use that, use that format flag as a starting point. And that's about it for this week. So see how you go with the assignment. It's it's not hard. Um, we've, we've we've written all the code except we did it with an array, we did it for an array list. All you need to do is adapt that same same sort of code to an array. Uh, so it's just a matter of keeping track of which pigeonholes have you used and what the maximum size is, and making sure you're not exceeding your array size. Okay. No final questions. Okay, we might head off there. Thanks for watching, have a nice day, and uh, get lots of practice, and uh, see you next week. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Yeah, thanks.